black compatriots. In a series of many firsts since assuming office as president and commander-in-chief of the armed forces, President Bola Tinubu relays his thoughts on Nigeria's 63rd independence anniversary, commencing with appreciation for the nation's founding fathers. Let us commend our founding fathers and mothers. Without them, there will have been no modern Nigeria. From the fading embers of colonialism, their activism, dedication, and leadership gave life to the belief in Nigeria as a sovereign and independent nation. Let in his 15 minutes nationwide broadcast, the president says he's unwavering in his resolve to lay a solid foundation. Those who sought to perpetuate the fuel subsidy and broken foreign exchange policies are people who will build their family mansion in the middle of a swamp. I am different. I'm not a man to erect our national home on the foundation of mud. To endure, our home must be constructed on safe and pleasant ground. Perhaps assuaged the agitations by organized labor, the president announces a six-month provisional wage increment, among others. Based upon our talks with labor, business, and other stakeholders, we are introducing a provisional wage award increment to enhance the federal minimum wage without causing undue inflation. For the next six months, the average low-grade worker shall receive an additional 25,000 Naira per month. The new CNG conversion scheme will start coming in very soon, as all hands are on deck to fast track the usual lengthy procurement process. We are also setting up training facilities and workshops across the nation to train and provide new opportunities for the transport operators and enterprises. Similarly, we are increasing investment in micro, small, and medium-sized enterprises. Commencing this month, the social safety net is being extended through the expansion of the cash transfer programs to an additional 15 million vulnerable households. Rentinibu also highlights his effort at repositioning the nation's Apex Bank. I pledged a thorough house cleaning of the den of malvisions the CBN has become. That house cleaning is well underway. A new leadership for the central bank has been constituted. Also, the special investigator will soon present its findings on the past lapses are how to prevent similar recurrences. Henceforth, monetary policy shall be for the benefit of all and not the exclusive province of the powerful and wealthy. The president who says he's not insensitive to the hardship associated with bold economic reforms appeals to Nigerians for understanding and bravery for the future. We can do it. We must do it. Jeffrey Uzongo, Channels Television News. Well, we heard the president's broadcast yesterday and we've heard it again today. But now let's hear a bit of what Nigerians, or we'll bring you that in a bit, what Nigerians were saying in reaction to the president's speech yesterday. But while we're waiting for that uh, film to come up, let's introduce our guest this morning. We have Mr. Billy Tafar Balewa, who's the first son of the first prime minister of, Ni of Nigeria's prime minister between... August 1957 and January 1966. So Tafar Balka, Tafar Balewa, thank you for staying with us. Thank you. And also joining us from the U.S., 
um, is Shola Adekoya, a tech entrepreneur. Thank you for joining us, Shola. Thanks for having me. All right, just before we bring you, you into the conversation, let's hear from Nigerians, their reactions to the president's broadcast yesterday. I would say, you know, it's a good speech, uh, but still there are things that uh, are left out. You know, the way things are in the land today, the growing poverty. People wanted to hear the big thing around minimum wage. Uh, people wanted to hear about how this subsidy whole thing will end. Because as you see, it looks like it's, it's parallel out of control, at least for the prices of, uh, of, of gas, diesel, with over a thousand naira. You look at the exchange rate, people would like, like to hear more about that. How come that uh, the naira is, uh, is, is equal to uh, one, uh, one dollar to, to a thousand naira, over a thousand naira? I expected Mr. President to have taken uh, time to explain how uh, banditry, kidnapping, and insurgency happen. Obviously, the not not taking it seriously and laying emphasis is to give credit to the times Pres former President Jonathan said we had Boko Haram in my government we eat and drink together. For me, I've, I've always taken the position on Independence Day, 63rd anniversary, the theme should be on the journey to nationhood. On the Democracy Day, we talk about the theme should be on Democracy Day. You know, issues regarding our journey to democracy, the, the entire democratization processes. And then that should not be mistaken for presidential addresses where, for example, you may decide to brief every month. That's where you present your report card. All right, Mr. Tafarbalo, let's start with you. Uh, tell us, um, with, the, with the background you have, uh, being a, a relative of the Prime Minister of Nigeria and one of the founding fathers of this nation, listening to the President broadcast yesterday, what, what would be your takeaway from it? Well, uh, I, I guess, well, thank you for having me first. And um, to correct you as well, I'm a grandson, not a son of the late prime minister. And um, yeah, back to your question. Um, it seems, yes, the government is becoming to be a little bit responsive listening. Uh, his speech yesterday, he seems to have calmed down to really want to meet the aspirations and the desire of the Nigerian people. Of course, the, the, the removal of the subsidy was a big blow to most Nigerians. And uh, uh, even Mr. President did it abruptly. He did it at the Eagle Square on his swearing in. He didn't really thought through about it. He didn't know that it's going to be like this. But um, yeah, his speech yesterday, he felt I mean, he said uh, he's feeling the people, which is very good. And uh, some good effort needs to come on board. Yesterday, they had a lengthy meeting with the Labour to trash it out. And then at the same time, uh, I'm not too comfortable with the palliatives they are giving uh, regarding the five billion they are sharing to states. I mean, for palliatives. I think more needs to be done. This is a day or two palliative. What is going to happen in the next coming months and perhaps years in this each situation? So the government needs to really think about it. What about employment, creating and enabling employment? If you give a person food today, who's going to give him tomorrow? You have to have a sustainable way of cushioning, not just uh, uh, the normal Nigerian way of uh, doing some odoji and you go away with it. They need to sit up see what they have to do, and put food on the table of Nigerians. Yes. We have a president, Nigeria currently has a president who um, was part of those, or part of the activism to bring Nigeria back to the, to the democratic space. And um, one would say that he's coming to that place right now to help to entrench democracy. Um, you say 
It looks as if he's, he's getting a grip of the assignment before him, but there are a lot of challenges around that many will say that he's not really speaking um, clearly on. He's just more like skirting the situation. Yeah, 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 you, 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 you are right. You see, people like us, I see the present president, President Bola Amit Tinubu, yes, as a politician. But what kind of politician? Most of them are transactional politicians. They do politics like business, and politics is not done like that. Business is different from politics. Of course, you can be a good transactional leader, but in politics, you, 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 you miss the point. Now, even if you are a transactional leader, you need to surround yourself with transformational leaders, people who will tell you what needs to be done and when to be done, how, how it should be done. So I think, um, yes, President Tinubu had been an activist. We knew him since then. This is a different ball game. It, was, it is easy for you to, to say, Mr. A, you are not doing it right. Now he is in the hot seat and he should be, I mean, of course, people like us are here now. We'll put him on the saddle and check him as well. So he really needs to sit down and think. Think in what? He has been a governor for eight years. That is for Lagos. And he has been a regional politician. Now he's coming into the national landlight. It's totally different from state regional. It is a complete, complex situation. Mm. So to be honest, uh, I expect him to perform. I pray for him to perform. We don't want Nigeria to be in, 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 in a bad situation on him. But then he needs to really sit up. The way a man, they are like a syndical. Like uh, you can imagine, I wonder, in the last 23 plus years that we've been agitating. So many other things couldn't have been done under the, this democratic dispensation since, I mean, Fourth Republic. I mean, we are now in our Tenth Republic. People are not happy. Common issues that has to do with the National Assembly are not being taken care of. You know, things need to be, people need to want to see the leaders uh, proactive, people who, who have their love at heart, mm. who really wants to change things. Because we can, this has to be business unusual, not business as usual. It can't go that way. We are seeing what is happening around us. The West Africa region, coups are taking place. It's not, just, it's not that because they want to make coups, it's because the politicians have made things so rigid that they don't want to change. Uh, Mr. Tafar Balewa, take... I'm going to come back yes. to you, um, being that you will tell us a bit about what your grandfather might have told you about the journey to nationhood. You tell us a bit about that. But let's, let's bring in Mr. Ade Konye here, who joins us from the U.S. Uh, tech entrepreneur, telling us a bit about what having heard the president and uh, run through his speech, the president said, I made promises about how I would govern this great nation at my inauguration. That's part of what the president said yesterday. I made promises about how I would govern this nation. It says to reshape and modernize our economy to secure lives, liberty, and property of the people. He re re reminded us of what he said at the inauguration again yesterday. So if you were to look at I mean, just over 100 days in office. What would you say the president has, has done? Has he hit the ground running? Yeah, so, so, so for me, and from, you know, considering my background, I, I would say that um, from my perspective, things are hopeful. And I mean this with all uh, sense of empathy for what is happening on ground in Nigeria. I mean, need to. Uh, we currently, in our space, investing in, in, in tech in Nigeria and in startups and in businesses in Nigeria. We, we are actually investing right now. And, and the reason being that we, we see, and, and I don't really know, want to get into the politics of, of things. And we see a, a president that's pro-business, a president that is going around the world trying to restore investor confidence in Nigeria. Uh, it, it will take time, but we're starting to see some commitment come from come from international community, from investors out, you know, outside of Nigeria. Uh, so that, that gives us some comfort to come and make some investments. And we're currently making some, some investment right now. Other things that we're, we're, we're seeing, we're, we're also seeing a president who um, a lot is going on at the same time. I think Nigeria is going through what we might call a V-shaped uh, recovery, uh, which means you first go down and hit Almost ground, almost almost uh, 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 the, the very bottom, 
before you start to you know, know, climb back up. You know, right now, it's very painful. We get that and we see that. And we see how the president is trying to stimulate the economy by, by also trying to get people stimulate spending by through all of this, uh, what we call stimulus. You know, it, the same thing happened in the U.S. back in 2008 when President Obama also was given some some sort of uh, stimulus package to try to stimulate the economy. So things like this we see over time would start to play out. In the immediate term, it, it's difficult and it, it's hard to really accept, you know, any of that I, to see the impact of anything that the president is doing. But over time, we will start to see. It takes time for for recovery to happen. Um, I, not to leave blame on anyone. Uh, it, it, this is not about politics. It's just really about, from our perspective, what we are seeing. Uh, we, we're seeing pro business. Uh, we're seeing that you know, if from an in, innovation standpoint, the president is supporting innovation. We, we've seen. Uh, I we strongly believe that the only one of the things that can really help Nigeria recover. It's not so much dependence on the government. It's really going to be innovation. If you really look at, from our perspective, it's going to be innovation. And we see a president who recognizes that, who has appointed the right people. Uh, we see the newly elected uh, Minister of uh, Innovation and Digital Economy, uh, who we know his, his pedigree and we know what he can do. Um, so appointing him to be there sends a signal to the, uh, to the uh, tech community that, I'm here for you. I'm here to 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 lay down some 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 policies to support your work and encourage you to come back to the economy. Now, I'm not saying that everything is all, you know, is all good at this point in time, but we're, it's hopeful. Uh, from my perspective, it's hopeful, and we see the president that's you know putting some things in place to to help you know secure um, uh, the economy over the long term okay, and so encourage. We, we hear, I hear you, and, and I'm sure everyone hears you here, but the things you've mentioned, some of the things that you've seen, you've seen a president who's pro-business, who's pro-innovation, who's, um, who's looking to get uh, investor confidence restored here in Nigeria. The, the other question would be, what are those parameters? You used the example of the U.S. back in 2008 and the recovery process, the V-shaped uh, recovery process, uh, but there are certain parameters or certain things that should be on ground or that should that should have been seen to have been set on ground almost immediately to see some of those things that we want to see in the future begin to happen. So do you see some of those um, necessities put in place to see those, the kind of recovery we want to see at the end of the day? Yeah, so, we, we, uh, so I guess maybe the first, the first thing to say here is I would have, I, I, we see some things, uh, to answer your question directly, uh, the, 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 the establishment of that parallel market is going to really uh, change things over the course of time. Now, it's painful in the short term in the sense that you see dollar going to about a thousand uh, uh, naira uh, and causing a lot of inflation. We see fuel subsidy and people, you know, causing pain on the economy. But those are things that would eventually, in the long term, really repair the economy. Uh, without remove, the removal of this fuel subsidy, we're going to be seeing um, a, a huge depletion or and the fast depletion of any reserve that Nigeria would ever have. I mean, over time, we would see that. What I would have loved to see in the short term as the president is making all these policies is to have some type of, some type of, you know, maybe to do it in a staggered, uh, to take a staggered approach where rather, rather than do everything in the first hundred days, maybe take one step at a time, so that the, the, the burden and the pain will be less uh, on, 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 on the citizens. But these things that he's doing are things that would, over the long term, really repair the economy. Uh, in the short term, it's, it's painful, and it's going to be painful in the short term, because they are abrupt. You know, these are things that people have, we've enjoyed over, over a long period of time, suddenly removed. So those, those will be painful. So, but long term, they would repair the economy. So I would have loved to see some type of staggered approach where some of these are some sort of, you know, in the, like in the example of the U.S., stimulus was put in place as the economy was really tanking. So at the end of the day, it lessens the effect of, of, of inflation and, 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 and job losses and all of these things on, on, the, on the citizens. So, but if we had seen some of these in place, then maybe it would have lessened the, 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 the impact and the pain would, have, pain would not be as severe as it is right now.
So yes, some things in place that we see, but they're all long-term, long-term initiatives or long-term uh, things that will have long-term impact. Okay, so we're talking nation building and nationhood, looking at the tomorrow beyond the yesterday and today. What are we going to do today towards tomorrow? So let me get back to um, Billy Tafar Balewa and ask him this question, what his um, grandfather might have told him as regards the journey to nationhood for Nigeria, being that he was Nigeria's prime minister at that time. And they were, he was one of those that helped to um, birth the, the nation we're looking at today. So Mr. Tafar Balewa, can you just give us an insight into some of the things that your grandfather might have shared with you and the ones you discovered after his passing? Well, I wish I had met him. I was born for a few years after he died. Uh, but um, yeah, I have read most of his memoirs. I've had, I've, I was fortunate to meet some of the few people he had interacted with closely, like the late Damas and Nikano, the, so many of them of late memory now. Most of them are gone. Um, I think they, they are different from leaders of today. Quite different, and, and their difference is nothing other than nationalism. They are Nigerians. First, forget they come from their regions and what have you, but the love for the country, because that was what united them, that was what brought about independence in the 60s. They were not united, it didn't have happened. You know, was really what helped them. And look, uh, you, you, in Nigeria, you must strike a balance. As a leader, what he tried to do, and what most of his people told me he tried to do, was to strike a balance. Nigeria need to strike a balance. Balance politically and economically. Mind you, Nigeria is a welfare state. Fine and good, I mean, this is a capital, I mean, a capitalistic world. We might perhaps at the end of the day go capitalist. But you have to govern Nigeria, you need to have some kind of a welfare system in you that you, you, you cushion some effects. We are not as advanced and Amer as, as America that you will drive this form of capitalism through. It's easy to do it there. Here we have our complexities and differences. And what they try to do, and which at times I wonder, Nigerians are now calling for uh, uh, changing the constitution, uh, I mean, referendum, uh, restructuring, and what have you. And to be honest, the restructuring they are calling for is to go back to the perhaps the late 60s, the regional, or the some kind of different arrangement. Then why, why, why did we scuttle that arrangement in the first place? I mean, we we need to go go ahead, go further. If we can come together at this material time, 63 years of independence, for God's sake. I wonder when would it be time for us to come together? We were talking in the media the other time. There are so many government interventions that was brought in, even after their time. The one time they tried to foster that national unity in all the other governments that came, they tried to foster national unity. At least let be one country. But where they make, I, I guess, where they got it right is you can't govern Nigeria transactionally. You cannot govern Nigeria. It's a multi complex society. You cannot govern Nigeria. You have to be transformational. Open your eyes because there are good people in all the regions of Nigeria and there are bad people. You cannot stereotype me, you see a northerner, you think he's an immigrant. Or perhaps you see a Yoruba man, you think he's a, he's a wayo wayo man, or a Connie man, or an Igbo man, you feel he's any Igbo man, you see he's it's a, it's a cheat. No, there are good people who have made this country proud as well. So you have to have that, that finesse to really pick the best out of them, and you like it. And this is not magic. This is pure and simple. You must know Nigeria for you to govern Nigeria. I'm optimistic with the current leaders that we have today. I'm optimistic because I am, I'm, 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 an, I'm, I'm a pragmatist. I believe Nigeria will go places. If only, if only we'll try and make things right. I mean, for, for God's sake, can you imagine up till now, we cannot give local government autonomy. How do you drive the, 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 the programs and whatever you want? States are still shackling local governments. They won't allow them to breathe. And yet, they are take away their money and do things with it. So leaders must really look inwards. What do you want to be? Is it legacy you want to leave or money? Because most of them are, are racing to be the richest. I mean, we should have to start looking inwards to see that it's not money that is everything. Yes, you need money. It's an oil. 
or rather a fuel. But then you need to have leaders who will want to die for the country. And if you don't do that, uh, my friend from America. Uh, oh dear, just as uh, you know, the um, conversation is getting interesting and we're getting um, some very profound thoughts from Mr. Tafa Balewa. It appears the communication um, may have uh, hung, but it appears that he's returning. Mr. Tafa Balewa. Oh, you are for us or for them. So there is no taking one side and then leaving the other side. You must strike a balance for you to be able to carry the people along. Yeah. yeah, so Mr. Tafa Balewa, I, I'm wondering how we can strike that balance and perhaps something that we could have gleaned from the president's speech on that balance and uh, the need for unity to come together as one uh, would have been, you know, uh, pointing us to a direction. But perhaps we, we, I, I can take out something from his speech. And he says, Nigeria is remarkable in its formation and essential character. We're a broad and dynamic blend of ethnic groups, religions, traditions, and cultures. Yet our bonds are intangible, yet strong, invisible, yet universal. We are joined by common thirst for peace and progress, by the common dream of prosperity and harmony, by the unifying ideals of tolerance and justice. Uh, is this enough acknowledgement of the challenge of our fault lines, particularly because, you know, just a day to the independence celebration, uh, the vice president had, you know, acknowledged that the elections that brought this administration was one of the most divisive in Nigeria's history. So could, could, could the president have been more elaborate about how, you know, to champion a cause for unity for Nigerians, just such that in the near future, Nigerians would begin to see themselves more as Nigerians than as uh, people from an ethnic nationality in one region of the country. Mr. Tafaba, yeah, that, that's for you. you. Yeah, I didn't get your earlier uh, speech because that was a glitch. But anyway, beautiful. The speech by Mr. President yesterday was beautiful. But, you know, I hope to see them walking the talk. He seems to have shown that, yes, he understood the problem on the ground. He knows the pains that Nigerians are suffering. And he seems to be a clinical doctor that thinks he knows how to fix it. What we want to see now is him walking the talk, not only him. The vice president, I have seen the vice president's speech. Even the speaker of the National Assembly, I have seen his speech, where they all seem to show that, yes, there is this problem. Yes, we know the problem is there, and we will do whatever we can to fix this problem. But, you know, it's a different ball game. I used to say, in wherever Pali I find myself, you know, Nigeria is so funny. 36 governors combined together are stronger than the president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. They dictate what happens. It's not about only you, the president. You must carry along the states and the National Assembly together. But I think from now, we haven't seen that happening. We want to see him carrying the National Assembly and the state assembly, I mean the state government, being in the same page with him, where they will start to drive the changes we want. Earlier, I told you about local government autonomy. I mean, for, for the past 20 plus years, National Assembly collect money from the federal government in the name of constitutional uh, amendment and what have you, and nothing will come out of it. They will whack the money and go away, and nobody cares to come and ask them, what is happening? Why didn't you do, do, do this? I mean, there are so many cracks in the foundation. We need to see them now mending the cracks. And mending these cracks is him, Mr. President, carrying everyone along. Forget the era of APC, PDP is gone. Now it's governors. What we want to see is proactive government government that not just only uh, we see them on, 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 the, on the pages of the newspaper and uh, print media telling us that, yes, we know we'll do this, we'll do that. Let it be seen to be done. That's what we're asking for. And I think we're not asking for too much. Besides, uh, there's a need for as well to engage the common people, the workers that the NLC now have struck a deal with the government. They are less than 2% of the Nigerian population. What about the 98% left? 
How is the government going to carry them along? No, any plan yet. Beside the 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 military ministry, they are now trying to capture another fifteen house of fifteen million household. I mean, something needs to be done, and uh, I believe I believe I'm hopeful. Tinubu being coming from the transactional side, a businessman par excellence, perhaps you will get the right people to help him do that. Otherwise, I'm sorry. Uh, for now, I, I yesterday, if you see me on Twitter, I'm really not a proud Nigerian. I'm a Nigerian, but not really a proud Nigerian as the way things are. We need to see movement, upward movement, for the betterment of the country. Mm. That's a very honest uh, admittance there, uh, Mr. Tafal uh, Baliwa. There's a lot to be proud of, you know, as far as the country is concerned. And this is, you know, the time to um, reflect on, you know, the positives that, is to, that are to come. Um, there's a lot coming out from, you know, some of the things that you have said, uh, the need for the leaders to be transformational rather than transactional, and, uh, you know, why we abandoned the template, the governance template, you know, that brought Nigeria prosperity, you know, at the beginning of its political history, which is where I'm headed, you know, but that will be after the break. But we also have joining us Professor Hafiz Abubakar, former uh, Deputy Governor of Kano State. I'll be coming to you, but that will be after the break. Stay with us. We'll be back shortly. Back is still Sunrise Daily on Channels Television, and we're, you know, bringing you our Independence uh, Edition, Anniversary Edition, a continuation from October 1. We still have with us uh, in our Kano studio, Professor Hafiz Abubakar, former Deputy Governor of Kano State and former Chairman, National University Commission. Of course, we still have with us uh, Mr. Billy Abubakar Tafar Balewa, uh, grandson of the first Prime Minister of Nigeria. And uh, we have joining us in our Lagos studio, uh, we'll come to him shortly, Professor Chris Imumolen, academic entrepreneur and politician. It's a convergence of academics on the program today. Uh, let me now come to you, uh, Professor Fiz Abubakar. Thank you for joining us on the program. Um, the president's speech is still in scrutiny as we reflect on nation building uh, this morning. Uh, Mr. Tafabalewa uh, Tafa has lauded that speech as containing positives and pointing us in the right direction as far as unity is concerned. But is it elaborate enough, particularly amid calls uh, this time around for restructuring? Thank you very much. Yes. Go ahead, Mr. Thank Ms. you very much for, for the opportunity to, uh, to have a word uh, this auspicious occasion of uh, 63rd uh, anniversary. Uh, I have listened to the many contributions. I want to totally agree with the last yes. uh, contributor, uh, Mr. Billy Tafawa Padewa. Uh, quite a beautiful speech. It has quite a lot of positives, but the problem remains the issue of translating the talks into actions. Walking, as he said, the talk. I think this has been one of the greatest challenges of our country. Uh, our leaders talk beautifully, but it happens that in the end, there is a serious disconnect between their tongues and their hearts. And this is exceptionally one of the key deficits in our leadership in this country. We don't lead by example. We believe that propaganda can take us through from the time of campaign to election and to governance. All through using the instruments of propaganda, 
feed our people. We as a people have been known globally to be very religious. Unfortunately, we are very religious. But the more the index of religion goes higher, the less the fear of God. Because the backbone of any religion should be the fear of the God that you worship, which is very, very low in our country. And God's fear actually is the backbone of truthful and purposeful leadership. Because only a leader that fears his God that will be fair, just and equitable in the administration of his people. And that is seriously a liking in our country. Ours is a blessed nation that is being settled. The whole world accepts. Many of us Nigerians have now accepted that this is a beloved, blessed nation of human material and other resources to be able to have a veritable place on the global map. But unfortunately, I think we have been our own enemies. And the key deficit is that of leadership. Leadership deficit has been our pain, and there is very little hope, actually, in that regard, because there is serious dominance by the wrong people of all sectors of leadership. My friend has just talked. The foundation, the system we are operating, the federal system, we, have, we are supposed to have three tiers of government, but we all know we only have one. We are supposed to have the local government, the state, and the federal government. And one of the key things now at this point, when we are going a very, uh, through very difficult times, the federal government itself you know, is not very sure of how it navigates this supposed to be short-term difficulties in taking the right decision for the long term. But to be able to administer the palliatives that can take care and take the common man and the common Nigerian through these difficult times is almost proven to be nowhere to be found and impossible. And one of the key reasons why it's so difficult is because we have wrecked the local government system. We have made it subservient to the state, and it is just an extension of the corrupt system of the state. So we are finding it very difficult. Just imagine if we had a proper local government system. It would have been very, very easy for us to cooperate in the local government, the state government, and the federal government to be able to bring a lot of succor to our people under these difficult times, and even in times of prosperity. That was the essence. That was the thinking of those who have proposed for this three-tier level of government. And these are the tiers that are working everywhere, whether it's the parliamentary system, whether it's the corporate uh, parliamentary system, whether the presidential system, whether it is the communist or socialist system, these tiers, especially the local government tier, exist and it functions very, very well. And that's why we as Nigeria, we travel all around, we appreciate the developments that we see around. It is part of the reason for us to appreciate that unless that third tier of government works properly, it is almost impossible for you to bring about development to the lowest level of the people. And we are seeing it at this time. I want to believe the federal government has very good intention of wanting to bring soccer to the people. But the environment is not there, unfortunately. The federal government alone cannot shoulder that responsibility. We are running a federal system. So these tiers of government have to be in total cooperation. And they have to be functional. But when you have already made the local governments to be appendages of the state government, and in the leadership recruitment system, the same extremely unfit, corrupt, you know, uh, people that don't fear God 
you know, either their personal or official lives, they don't fear God because it is only somebody who doesn't fear God that will be saying what he doesn't mean from his heart. If you take to beautiful speeches, you will believe that all oh, our leaders understand all our challenges and they even understand the solutions. But that is not the case. When it comes to practice, oh, I think everybody knows the answer in this country. But Professor, Abubo, uh, P Professor Hafiz, would you say that uh, you know, the local governments, while you served in Kano State, enjoyed as much financial autonomy that would have given them the independence um, you know, to provide good governance at the grassroots? It doesn't start with financial economy, uh, independence. It starts with the leadership recruitment system. Fundamentally, if the leadership recruitment system is faulty, which is the case now, you know, you recall there has been a lot of cries from people to scrap the state independent electoral commissions because they have just been bastions of corruption and strengthening this bad leadership recruitment process. It's a first step. I'm not saying INEC is perfect, but it would have lessened, it would have lessened the problem we are facing in the leadership recruitment system, you have to recruit the right people at the local government level before you come to the independence, I mean, financial independence. I think the last administration had tried to remit funds to the local governments directly. But what happens when they even do that because of the very bad leadership at the level of the local government and the state government, and they have been tujis and cronies, of the state governors and their aides, what happened? Majority of the funds have been just round tripped back to those that have appointed them there or selected them there. Many people are not participating in even the state uh, organized local government election. Many, substantial number. So when you look at even the level of apathy, if you look at the number, those elections should, shouldn't even stand. When 10%, 12%, 5% of the eligible electorates are the ones voting in those termed state organized elections, you will see that there is a fundamental issue, and that is of the leadership recruitment process itself. So, personally, you need to address the leadership recruitment process before you come to the issue of the independence of funding. Professor Fees, and um, you know, some would even say that um, the reasons that they may be stooges, that's local government chairman in the first place, you know, are debatable uh, besides the concern about the leadership recruitment process. But let me come to you, um, Mr. Shola, our guest, um, you know, that joins us via Zoom. You are a tech um, entrepreneur, and you know, in that space, uh, there's been, you know, a lot of enthusiasm about the new Minister of Communication, you know, but there's also that uh, challenge, you know, of uh, the, what should be contained in course curriculum where tech is concerned, the absence of chat GPT, um, artificial intelligence in much of our education system. Uh, but besides, yes, Mr. Adekoye, besides um, the education system, there's also agriculture that requires tech. What partnerships can that ministry form with the agriculture sector, the education sector, uh, to introduce a technology that will bring substantial progress to those sectors of the economy for growth? Mr. Adekoye, that's for you. Yeah, so, I mean, so it, that, that ministry needs to partner with the private sector. There's a whole, there's a lot of innovation going on on the ground, but they they lack funding, they lack the exposure, they lack the access to 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 avenues where they can introduce some of these solutions here. Uh, before innovation can really start to make impact on the Nigerian economy, it needs to really be accepted. And right now, we're at the very beginning stages of it. Um, it will take some time for us to actually see the impact of that. But, but for now, some partnerships as far as digitalizing the economy, we have to see one of the things that needs to be done is to really partner with um, 
tech, uh, technology expert or companies outside of Nigeria to bring some 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 uh, you know help us develop the digital economy in Nigeria, and then create access to uh, create access to, for funding to the uh, private sector. There's a lot of innovation on ground. We need Nigerian innovators to solve Nigerian problems. But the partnerships that needs to be done is really partnerships with maybe banks, private sector, investors you know, abroad to, to continue to invest in the Nigerian uh, you know, startup ecosystem. The solutions are, are there. You know, we've seen a lot of solutions, a lot of uh, tech uh, innovation coming out of agriculture. Uh, we, we, we've seen how you know, agro-processing waste can now be used to generate electricity. We've seen how you know the, some startups have actually come up to to go to universities to pre, to to to, to uh, pre propose ideas about teaching uh, students uh, tech right from right from right from schools and adding tech to curriculums in schools so that the these students will graduate with some understanding of tech and they can branch out to be entrepreneurs themselves. So most of the partnerships that need to be done is really just with investors. Really more investment needs to come into the innovation and tech space to fund Nigerian ideas to solve Nigerian problems. There's a lot of ideas on ground, but most of the in investment that we're seeing are going into one particular segment of the tech ecosystem most of which is fintech and you know we we see that as as a good thing but without funding education without funding agriculture it's we're not going to have um we're not going to have a balanced you know ecosystem because most of nigerian wealth will still be migrated outside of nigeria through just fintech you know if nigerians can't buy agricultural products or or or, or can't get enough from agriculture in nigeria can't get enough education in Nigeria, then they will spend Nigerian money to go get it outside of Nigeria. That's migrating Nigerian wealth outside of Nigeria as well. So we need to establish domestic markets in agriculture by investing in all these different startups. There are many entrepreneurs who are hungry, who have strong ideas, great ideas that are that are ready to do the work as well, but lack investment, lack access. You know, so, so the, the partnerships will be to just draw investment into this space, more investment. That, and one thing I do have to say is that we also see many foreign companies now coming to Nigeria to present themselves or disguise as 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 Nigerian companies. Well, that also needs to be looked at. And uh, we know we, we've we've talked to the Nigerian Startup Act to really look into that as well. This investment needs to go to Nigerian in Nigerian startups, Nigerian solution uh, 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 providers. We we don't want for foreign companies coming to Nigeria and acting as Nigerian companies, taking all the investment and then creating solutions that don't exactly solve Nigerian problems. So for us to really see things in agriculture and education, it needs to there needs to be more transparency in that. There needs to be some attraction for. Uh, for for investors to come into this space and invest in Nigerian ideas, solving Nigerian problems. Indeed, and I wonder if you know um, it's the private sector that needs to play the key role in that regard. What about the public sector? But let me bring Professor Chris Imumolen into the picture now. Professor Chris Imumolen, thank you for joining us. Uh, Professor Imumolen is an academic, entrepreneur, and politician. is also the Vice Chancellor, Global Wealth University, and President, Onshore Offshore Oil and Gas Professionals Nigeria. Thank you. That's quite some experience. So uh, perhaps you pick up from you know some of the points raised by uh, Mr. Adi on um, the need also you know to check that space, but particularly with the Nigerian startup uh, bill, which has become law by the way, and uh, you know where there are a lot of foreign companies you know coming into the space and you know uh, you know fronting as Nigerian companies, but particularly what can also be done about the public sector where um, ed tech agri-tech and uh, fintech is concerned such that there can be meaningful growth in that sector. Okay, thank you for this um, chance for talking here. And um, when we talk about public sector, you know, public sector, which um, comprise of the, majorly the public servants and um, ministries, the MDAs, ministries, department and agencies, you know, it's very key because these are actually the driver 
of um, the federal government policies and federal government um, intentions. So it's important that um, the, 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 the sector needs to be looked into. And um, I often would say that digitalizing such sector is very important. And it starts by training, retraining, and reorientation of the manpower who runs the sector. For too long a time, we have um, a public sector in Nigeria that have, you know, have lived far beyond, far, far, below, far behind where it ought to live. That is why most of the federal government ideas and initiatives, though might look wonderful in the paper, but when it comes to implementation, it does not hit the ground running the way it ought to be. Why? Because most of the drivers of those sectors do not have many, most of them do not have what the kind of knowledge, the kind of skill set needed to drive a digital economy and digital ecosystem. I just listened to the person talking from California. Very wonderful idea. But the sector, the public sector you mentioned, mm -hmm. it's, it's, you know, why, you know, you did mention one thing that I also contested for president in the last election. And one of the things we were saying was that, let's look at the civil servants, for example, the civil service. We had the civil service reform, we had a lot of things, but we still get to know that the civil servant, which is the driver of the government policies, need a lot of um, systemic reorientation, a lot of um, mental orientation, and a lot of restructuring even right there, and which by itself cannot help to drive that digital ecosystem we talk about. When there's a need for connectivity even amongst this, you know, if you go through what is happening in the public sector, you'll be so amazed at the kind of analog the system is. You know, we've had many at times where government will give mandates, say mm -hmm. digitalization mandate. Every ministry, every agency must start um, digitalizing its operation before social deadline. And there have never been a time such a deadline have been. Have been. So there's a need for total overhauling of that system. There's a need for collaboration. Uh, uh, absolutely. And what about the education sector? You talked about the analog system. Most mm. of, you know, the public schools have, you know, just the basics in computer uh, course, but no sophistication uh, that will require the innovation that will prepare those young people, you know, when they leave um, the secondary education system and the university education system into the workspace, you know, for them to wield the much needed influence for innovation and growth. So what can be done at that level? That's why I'm asking about partnerships mm. you know, between the communication ministry, the education ministry, and the agriculture ministry. Yes, you know, our educational system is overhauled. It's, um, it's, what's it called? It's, it's overpopulated. Let me mm. use that word. We're a country of about 220 million people, and I've often recommended that for proper attention to be given, let's talk about education, to our educational sector. I had um, offered to say that even the ministry should be separated. We should have a ministry that is focused on pre, as in the secondary and the primary, primary and secondary education, for proper focusing. Then we have a ministry that is purely focused on vocational and technical education, and we have another for post-secondary, which is the tertiary education. This by itself will help to give more attention to seeing the problem we have. And that attention will help to start driving factors that are needed, like we talk about digitalization, mm -hmm. um, what's it called, technology, that will help the young ones to, to, to begin to unnest skills that will help us drive our, our economy. You know, once we're able to have this attention, you know, you, you begin to see that whatsoever is budgeted. We have, for example, the last budget had about 7 point something percent budgeted for education alone. But we begin to ask, these things are in the budget, but how come it's not materializing? We are not seeing it effective. Mm -hmm. In one is, we need key focus. Once you see a minister of education, just watch it. His focus is always on the post, the university. The university. And I can tell you without my word that about 60 percent of our students from the secondary school are not even groomed enough to have basic knowledge. We're not even talking about technology now. Basic knowledge in basic subjects, mm. let alone technology that will help them migrate to the university and become who they ought, ought, ought to be. So we need. Is a it a curriculum problem? One, it's, it's, it's a focus problem. We need to. Div that is the biggest ministry. Your ministry that is attending to 
over 80 million Nigerians in school, we need to first have a focus on them so that there will be, okay, well now we have a Minister of Education. Maybe the government can be thinking of having maybe people in various positions that will properly give focus to this. For example, let me give an example. A state like Zamfara, schools have been shut down for three years. So you don't, we're not even talking about um, digitalization there mm. because there's insecurity challenges. There's, we, we, we also have this, um, we know we are a religious country and you, if you go far north, there, there, there's this apathy towards a kind of Western education. There's a lot of things that we need to really look into before just jumping to say, okay, if you look at the South, for example, who have been privileged before um, um, post-colonial era, before the, um, um, after, after independence, to have um, as, um, I, what's it called? embraced education to, to a kind of extent. But, but, but again, it's the question of having, those, having our children have this digital education becomes, becomes a problem. So what, what I would say is there's a need for attention, there's a need for focus to ensuring that the curriculum that we have, we don't have issues with curriculum, I can tell you. I've gone through, I'm an academia, I've seen this curriculum, maybe one or two things should just be added. You know, you made this mention of chat GPT, robotics. Mm. We, we now have coding lessons for, we now have a lot of private schools, public schools, right? We have the internet, where many people are now, our children are beginning to, Nigeria is, Nigeria I can tell you without, Nigeria is a tech savvy, um, um, economy, country. yeah, country, without even the educational support. So we don't really have a big issue. What the issue we have is just the issue of focus. And many people might not be seen in that way. They might just say, "Oh, teach these people." By the time you do those things, you end up you end up seeing that there is no there is no frantic effort being made in that. So our curriculum is okay, maybe a one or two touches, but we need to begin to look at dividing those ministries so that we can have focus. Let's look at the premises. Other countries are having it. We have other countries that are not as big as Nigeria and West Africa who have ministers for each of these three sectors so that they can be focused on it. Education is very important. If, but that, that's expanding the cabinet. No, it's and not, we're already con no, it's concerned not, about you know, not, the it, high cost of governance no, no, it's not about, because of the number of ministries under no, this administration. No, it's not about expanding. It's about what we want to achieve. If we are able to, at the end of the day, develop Nigerians whose mind are developing a way to solve our local problems. We had someone. If you're able to, it doesn't, we look at the cost and effect analysis now. It's not about expanding. Education is the biggest ministry we have. That is the truth. And if Nigerians, if we continue this way, in Sokoto, for example, we're talking about education. In Sokoto, last year, only one person wrote WAYEK. One person sat for WAYEK. So you can see, it's not about whether the cost or no cost. What is the cost of having our, 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 our children not educated at the end of the day compared to the cost of wanting to? So that is my simple advocate, that we need to begin to look at the Ministry of Education and have it divided. So for proper focus, for proper attention, so that we can help in training our children to gaining those knowledge required. Then ICT also, providing that environment for them Retraining the teachers, even the teachers who teaches these courses. How many do we have of them? Many of the teachers, even not just in primary and secondary school, even in the university. I, I must tell you one thing. ICT um, providers are one of the scarce, scarce personnel you get because they are not usually, um, for those who run companies who know this, those who have schools who know they are not usually on ground because they, they are needed so much. So we need to begin to retrain um, those that are going to train them expose them to countries like West Indian, who currently is doing very, very well in, 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 tech, in tech sector, and bring them back. The concept of reverse engineering would help us as a country. We don't need to do so much. There are countries who are already doing what we want to do. No, let's do what Taiwan, like what, Chap what Japan, what China did so many years ago. Copy, bring Nigerians to look at this technology, and duplicate it in Nigeria. Mm. It's, not, it's, not, it's not rocket science. We begin to what is what is working in other countries. countries. Okay, if Egypt, for example, is doing so well, a country is doing so well in med med medicine, and is adopting technology in it, if Israel is doing so well in agri and is applying technology in it, if U.S. is doing, look at what are they doing? Like, can we begin to look at these things and begin to look at the concept, the, the components that makes them do so well, and begin to have our Nigerian curriculum, have our Nigerian people look at the same technology. And we start by copying, we start by reverse engineering, and by so doing, ingenuity comes in.
Mm. Yeah. Interesting. The over-dependence on, you know, one aspect of an expansive Ministry of um, uh, Education and its implication on our need, you know, to uh, power a knowledge-driven economy. Um, but there's also the concern about insecurity on, um, you know, in the agri sector and how um, innovation and technology can be introduced into that sector in the first place. So many concerns arising from this conversation, and I hope that uh, you know, Nyota will also have you know, similar poses related to, to these subject matters. We're due for another break. When we return, we'll have more questions and more seasoned analysts on the program. Stay with us. Welcome back. We still have all our guests here. And uh, yes, Buki was asking a lot of questions there. We still have Billy Tafar Bale, our grandson of Nigeria's prime, former prime minister, Professor Afiz Abubakar from our Kaduna Kanu studio, Jala Dekonye, who joined us from the U.S., Washington in USA, and Professor Chris Imumolen, who's in our legal studio. But let me start with you, Professor Abubakar. Um, on that matter of splitting the education ministry, um, Professor Imumolen talked about um, splitting in in order to give focus to certain areas. That had, I think the question had to do with the issue of curriculum. Our curriculum is such that we produce graduates who are more or less job hunting, not ready to get in there and begin to create the jobs that can change, uh, econo that can contribute immensely to our economy. So what's your take on the suggestion to split the education ministry? Well, um, first of all, I'm going back to the, the issue of curriculum. I, I don't think uh, it would be fair to put all the blame on our curriculum. Yes, at any moment, first of all, let's understand that curriculum is dynamic. It's not anything permanent. Under every circumstance, curriculums are supposed to be reviewed periodically because they guide on the a type of education that you want to give related to the time, the circumstances, the civilization as it is going. So curriculum is supposed to be dynamic. It's not supposed to be a permanent issue. And I think we have been reviewing. Right now, I'm fully aware, the National Universities Commission have for the last two years been engaged in the curriculum review. The review itself is still ongoing. It has been ongoing for about uh, two years now. And uh, by the time it's finished, maybe in the next five years it needs to be reviewed. Uh, I, I support uh, Professor in terms of the issue of split for the reasons that he gave, the issue of focus. If it is split, I think they will be more fo focused. Right now, when one ministry houses it, as he says, the tertiary level of education dominates, even though 80% of the staff of the Federal Ministry of Education, are from the secondary schools. Most of the middle level and senior level management of the Ministry of Education are former principals that started as teachers from secondary schools, federal uh, secondary schools. So that sector is dominating the senior and middle level management of the ministry, but yet you have very little progress on the part of particularly the primary and the secondary schools. In my own understanding as an academic of the last 35 years, I think one of the deficits we have is the issue of regulation. The primary and secondary school level of education is not being properly regulated. When you look at the tertiary level, all the three sectors of the tertiary level, the universities, the polytechnics, and the colleges of education have a regulator. The NUC is regulating the university education. The MBT is regulating the polytechnic education, while the NCCE is regulating the uh, teacher education at the tertiary level. But when it comes to the primary and the secondary school levels, we don't have a regulator. UBEC is not a regulator for primary and junior secondary schools. The recently commissioned 
Secondary School Commission is not a regulator, rather that they are funding agencies. So I think one of the things that we need to put in place are regulators. We can have one regulator, we can have two regulators for the, for the first basic and the basic level of education. I think that will in itself you know, help to uh, put focus, as my colleague was saying. Issue of focus, because when you have this unit standing on their own, with their own level of authority, because the issue is they are within the same room as Federal Minister of Education. We even have a Minister of State that normally is in charge of the uh, primary school education. But unfortunately, junior ministers are like supervisors. They are not managers because they don't take decisions. The senior ministers actually are co-decision makers. So you find that, as I always say, when you give anybody a responsibility, you just have to give him the accompanying authority to be able to be accountable. Unfortunately, no, Professor Mubaka, if, if I may come in here, the matter of absent. splitting, and I therefore mean, splitting them. Can, can I can I come in, them, uh, Professor Mubaka? The matter of splitting the ministry. Um, we're talking about cutting down cost of government, but you've just again sort of like suggested again creating a regulatory agency for the primary and secondary education, just like there is a regulatory agency for the tertiary education. Um, wouldn't that be all burdening an already bogus or an already bloated uh, workforce or where cost of governance is increasing the more instead of bringing it down by creating, splitting the ministry, creating more regulatory agencies? Meanwhile, there, there are, there's a permanent secretary in the Ministry of Education and there are directors heading each of these different um, arms or structures in the, in the education sector in Nigeria. So why do we need to create another ministry, as you see, for focus, as you as Professor Imumala said, for focus, when these people are there and they are supposed to be doing what they're supposed to do, monitoring, regulating, and managing the education sector? Well, they have different roles, to be honest, to, to be honest with you. First of all, uh, in terms of the issue of cost of governance, uh, by way of budgetary allocation, we are still within 7% of the budget being allocated to the whole education sector. We are still far away. The minimum UNESCO recommendation of 25% is still very, very far away in our country. So if truly we understand that education actually is the bedrock of development, then you take it alongside the other sectors and do the cost-effective analysis Whatever you do in the education sector will not contribute to any burglary because we are still very, very far away from the level of funding that we are supposed to be. Coming to the officials that you are mentioning, under the same roof, you find that the system within the Federal Ministry of Education is talking of hierarchy. And the university, whoever, for example, is heading the National Universities Commission, is being seen as the most senior person in terms of the committee of advice to the Honorable Minister. These officials surround the minister, and it goes like in terms of hierarchy. So when it comes to managerial discussions, focus, and decisions, it takes precedence along this hierarchical uh, ladder. So that's why you find that the tertiary level, with all its you know, encumbrances and challenges, dominate the space. And therefore, yes, they are there, but I wish you can just take an analytical, you know, uh, uh, what can I say, a visit to the Ministry of Education, and you will see this very, very clearly. So in terms of focus, I think uh, it is worth uh, the, uh, the road to follow that so that we can, at a certain stage after achieving some you know, milestones, we can just come back into one umbrella at a stage. Let, let me come back to you, Professor Christine Mumala, and, and then uh, all our, our, our panelists, you just weigh in on this one question about the, the recruitment process, um, leadership recruitment process in Nigeria. I mean, 
The president spoken, so we're looking at going forward, building a tomorrow, a Nigeria that everyone can be proud of. So let's have all of us weigh in on this matter. How do we go about changing our leadership recruitment process? How do we birth in every Nigerian that understanding that where you are, you're a leader, and so when you step in or you have to, you're given the opportunity to select someone to lead, to be the first amongst equals, just know that where you are, you have something to contribute to all of this. Let me start with you, Professor Imuwale. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, first, you know, we, we talked so much a lot about restructuring. I, I feel that we need to start by restructuring our mind as Nigerians. You know, I went through the um, election process and it gave me um, an experience to truly know Nigeria, not just from the academic part or from the entrepreneur part, which I have, but from the perspective of one, politics, economy, and the rest. And I saw Nigeria truly. And if we must have the kind of leader that we want, the recruitment process to select right leaders, it starts one with a child that is giving birth to, what do we feed the child? What environment is the child exposed to? It starts by re-engineering re our educational system. Education is not just about schools. It's about formal, non-formal, and informal. What the child that is giving birth to from the a day old is being fed, what makes up his mind, what kind of value system he has, what kind of influences he has. So if we must have good leaders, you know, it's about Nigerians themselves. Nigerians are product of our environment. You see people being given appointment and they are celebrating, dancing. You know, that shows you what, what our value system is. We have problem, we have an enormous challenge in the economy. I believe whosoever is appointed or selected to lead should even think first to say, oh, there's an enormous problem we must fix. And at this time where we have budget deficit, our FX is bad, our, 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 so many things. So, so that value system is very key. Re-engineering our mind, revamping our educational system, talking to religious leaders, influential people to begin to send right signals to the mind of Nigeria, to begin to have a value shift, a mind shift, to have a better Nigeria. In that way, we know that whosoever is selected is not going to be about the process, because if we are going to look at the process itself and say we need to select the right people. You know, <laughs> where are you selecting from? It's not about the process, it's about the people. If we are sure that in maybe in 20, 20 years from now, we are able to work on the Nigerian ecosystem, Nigerian people, by revamping what goes into the mind of Nigeria, how Nigerians are being groomed from a day old to to, to their youthful stage, to the adult stage, then we are sure that no matter whatsoever the kind of leadership system we use in recruiting Nigerians, we are sure of recruiting at least Nigerians that can have Nigeria at heart. That is mine. Then again, that shouldn't mean that we should throw away the system. The system is key. I am an advocate of developing a systemic economy. Nigeria as it is today is not a digital economy. And any, any economies that still runs that still run analog will be 40. Any system that needs human input to decide at every time will be 40. So we need to begin to database our country. We need to begin to run a digital system that will be able to identify Nigerians, know who Nigerians are. You know, it's about what the problem we have to me in Nigeria is a systemic problem. You know, for example, let's look at how do we even identify in Nigeria? Because we're talking about selecting who? Selecting Nigerians. You know? So how do we identify, how does a Nigerian acquire a, its, its passport to, 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 as a Nigerian? Look at those processes. It tells you that there's a lot of fault in the system that, that makes up Nigeria. So as, as people, we need to begin to look, look back. How we need to identify Nigeria? I know we have the NIM system of identifying, numbering ourselves, but they are not effective. They are not really telling who Nigerians are. We are in a country truly where anybody thank can you. become a Nigeria. So, one, the value system for Nigeria. So, Imola, Imola, we thank Nigeria. You. Then Imola, then we, <laughs> you've spoken quite a lot. Let me just get this, pass this on to another professor, Professor Hafiz Abubakar. Your take on the leadership recruitment process and, as um, your colleague said, mindset, mindset renewal for Nigerians. How do we go about that? Again, I... Uh, <laughs> I can say I always agree 
uh, not because he's my colleague, but uh, he's always saying the, uh, the right thing. I think my mindset is, is key. Mindset is key because of the level of decadence that we have gone. Here at this point, I want to believe two levels of leadership have a critical role to play here. We have our religious leaders and our cultural or community or traditional leaders. I think uh, they, 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 they will have to play a, a very critical role. And of course, uh, our people, because some of it to start from our home training, you know, our upbringing, and then a lot of advocacy, a lot of advocacy on the fear of God from our religious leaders, what is right, that whatever you do in this world, you will be held accountable for it. And besides, the dignity of the human race, actually, that you need to contribute possibly towards its development. So our religious leaders, in my own view, will have a critical role. So also our various community leaders who enjoy a lot of respect from us. To not only talk, but lead by example. I think in the issue of the subject matter of mindset, they will have a critical role to play, especially for those that are upcoming our youth. All right. So that uh, the subject matter will be increased patriotism, increased love for our country, and love for God's sake. We love for God's sake, expecting reward in our own lives and in the lives of those that we leave behind. All right, thank I think you. that will also play a very important role. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for your contribution, Professor Afiz Abubakar. Let's hear from you, Shola Adekonye, uh, this matter of um, mindset renewal, rebuilding our nation. In the, first of all, the issue of recruitment needs to be an inclusive one. It no longer has to be about religion or about culture or about gender or about anything. It has to be who can do the job that needs to be included, that needs to be hired. Right now, officially, well, the world is now in uh, a new industrial revolution, which is the digital industrial revolution. About more than 90% of all Nigerians that are tech savvy did not learn from, from, from public school. They either learned on their own or learned from, from, from private school. Now, in this, in this industrial revolution, we need people that, are, that have the mindset, the progressive mindset, to really steer Nigeria in that direction, in the direction to meet to catch up to the rest of the world and be well positioned in the future. So it no longer it has to be inclusive. Who can do the work? We already see some things done by the president. He's hired some people who we believe, you know, have lived the experiences, have, have done some things in the private sector. And by bringing them on there, it, it really does restore some, in, uh, in, in some confidence that the president is recruiting the right people. But more, there still needs to be a lot more done uh, in that regard. Uh, it needs to cascade down all the way to, to, to the local government, to the state government. It needs to cascade down, not just at that level, but all the way down, even to the private sector. It no longer needs to be, you know, who I know, who, uh, who, who, who is next in line. It has to be who we have to give regard and we have to give some respect to the people that have served in the long term. But we also have to include people that can actually do the work that can help position Nigeria for this new industrial revolution. Right now, Nigeria is behind, you know, unfortunately, way behind. And if we're going to really get Nigeria there to make to recruit the right people that will make the right policies in education, in agriculture, and really position Nigeria for the future, it needs to be who can do the work. Uh, we've, we've heard calls by the president and the, and the minister, the new minister calling people all around the world who, you know, should come back home and try to do the work. It's not about hiring people that are coming back home. It's about who is qualified, who has the mind, who has the mind to really align uh, to the vision uh, or to, uh, to, uh, to position Nigeria for the future. Okay. Uh, the Industrial Revolution has already kicked in, so we need to, we need to really be positioned and catch up to the rest of the world. All right, thank you. Uh, Mr. Tafar Balewa, please. 
Well, yeah, I think, um, you see, uh, I do agree that one of the biggest problems we have in this country is the leadership recruitment. We, we, we had it fine. You can see pre-independence and even after independence, there was this leadership recruitment institutions in virtually every part of Nigeria. But I guess due to the intermittent military rule that we've had, it erodes that system we've had. The cultural, religious system that Professor Hattie said, it used to be there. But over time, with the introduction of the military rule for so many years, that got eroded. And then suddenly politics came in. We, 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 we must go back. The unfortunate thing that is really is the bane of Nigeria in every spell of display, politics, business, and what have you, is organization. We are not organized people. That has been our problem. And I keep wondering, what can we do to get ourselves organized? That's the only key that we need to be on the top of the world, African world. We need to organize ourselves. It's not because you have have money automatically you become a leader no way it's not done like that anywhere go to america it's not done like that or you have influence you are in government automatically you become a leader i still have my reservations in terms of the cabinet mr president have i mean there are a lot of people who are given ministerial positions because they have lost elections some are green homes they don't know nothing they're just coming in and but i'm hopeful i'm hopeful things will work out because i love my country but to be honest we must give emphasis on re leadership recruitment, especially to the younger ones. Because right now, it's so unfortunate. They think the only way you can access power is go and steal money, because that's the in thing. Go steal money from government, come present yourself, and you become who you want to be. Now, the, the traditional systems must come on board. Right. The religious systems must come on board. And even government must try to see that, yes, they drive that. Unlike you see most states, they are employing or giving appointment to their children and their friends, their girlfriends, and what have you. That's not governance. All right. Governance is a serious business, and we must see it to be done, and that's the best thing for Nigeria. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Billy Tafabalewa, grandson of Nigeria's former prime minister and politician who joined us via Zoom from Bauchi. Thank you for coming in this morning. We also heard from our Kano studio the former chairman of the Nigeria Universities Commission, Professor Hafiz Abubakar. Then we have Shola Adekonye, who's a tech entrepreneur, joining us from Washington in the USA. And then we had, in our Lagos studio, we had Professor Chris Imumolen, academia, entrepreneur, politician, and a court presidential candidate 2023 general elections. I want to thank you all for sharing your thoughts and your morning with us. But we do have feedback from you, the viewer. We have this one from Alexander Alassa, who says, God bless Pa Ben Odiase, the composer of the greatest national anthem in the world, Arise, O Compatriot, the Nigerian anthem. The lyrics are people-centered, inspiring, noble, prayerful, visionary, prophetic, and indeed very divine. However, Nigeria today is the very opposite of our national anthem. Our leaders are nothing close to what our anthem stands for, as they lack love, commitment to services, and promote disunity. Our youth are totally lost from the path of truth and honesty. Our national anthem is a blueprint to the achievement of a great future of Nigeria, but a lot of our leaders and youth don't even know the words. I hereby recommend we all take time to ponder on the lyrics of our national anthem and have a reflection of our nation. Happy Sober Independence. That's from Alexander Alassa. Mm, very profound there. Uh, we have time for one more. This one is from Yemi, who says, My support and prayers for our president, that as a citizen, I'm going through a lot, yet I believe in you. That even has, well, this is very, very complex. <laughs> I think I'll go to the next one. Pastor Law Alpha Cross says, Government is expected to deploy last-minute workable measures to dissuade the proposed strike action from the organized labor. If the strike happens, Nigerians will suffer more. And that ends, you know, our...
uh, reading of your tweets and messages this morning. We thank you very much. And perhaps uh, in response to your concerns, the president said yesterday, I am different. I am not one to build our national patrimony on mud. So we'll be holding him to account in the uh, coming days and years you know, on those words. We thank you very much for your time uh, on the program today. God bless Nigeria. I am Bukola Koka. I am now Tagwe. Thank you for letting us be a part of your morning. We will. Goodbye.